spent billions of dollars. If it failed to achieve its goal with such an investment, it would indeed be a large and bitter pill for the taxpayers to swallow. The cost of the program, whose sole goal was to be the first to plant a flag on the lifeless rock just outside the Earth, if adjusted for inflation to the 21st century, was $135 billion. With a profit margin of just 7%, this would be equal to over $9 billion profit going to the privileged contractors chosen by their friends at NASA. If the machinery was in fact only achieving Earth orbit, as other earlier missions had already done, then the completion and functionality of the other components would not have been as important, and even more profit would have been made. $135 billion could feed 2 million people for their entire lives. It could also buy 2 million two-bedroom houses. Yet how could such an undertaking be kept secret, and for such a long time? To the latter, one needs only to remember that an unsolved riddle six years older, the assassination of President Kennedy, still daunts the minds of the vast majority of Americans. As a parent of a conspiracy, as his assassin being assassinated himself, the truth of the matter has still escaped history. In keeping a secret of the magnitude of the Apollo missions being fraudulently created, one turns to the Manhattan Project for comparison. Surreptitiously building the first nuclear bomb during the early to mid-1940s involved 129,500 people over a three-year period. Yet the secret did not get out. A quarter century later, the art and technology of espionage inevitably improved, narrowing dramatically the number of players in the know of a large clandestine operation. Just one year before the first mission to the moon, NASA launched the Tetra satellite, specifically designed to simulate flight data coming from the moon, so that the ground crews could rehearse the landing, much as the astronauts did in their own simulations. Had it not supposedly fallen back to Earth, all that would have been needed during the actual flight would be a repeat of one of these computer programs, with a few original variations, transmitted to the satellite for rebroadcast to Houston Scores of computers and their deceived operators on the ground would then receive prearranged information, including the alleged location, altitude, and fuel consumption of the spacecraft as if it were descending to the moon's surface. If the Soviets tried to find the actual location of an Apollo crew in the hundreds of thousands of miles surrounding the Earth and the moon, it would be tantamount to trying to find a rowboat in the Atlantic Ocean. The fact that the Apollo program was so departmentalized with various construction and test sites around the country meant that only a few people saw the whole picture. And for the first time ever, there was no independent press coverage of such an historical event. Whatever pictures and sound were distributed to the public were strictly controlled and previewed by the federal government. They were then disseminated unchecked until this hour. For who would realize that the unthinkable was not only possible, but absolutely true. And what of the photographs? What do they tell us? On three separate occasions, our office asked NASA's public relations department for every single picture of an astronaut on the surface of the moon, just during the maiden voyage of Apollo 11. Many duplicates were sent. In all, fewer than 20 pictures were found, including first-hand investigation on site at the agency's vaulted archives. Quite surprising, considering the historical significance of the event. These very photographs are the same ones circulated year after year on anniversary commemorations. It is estimated that in just the first 60 minutes on the moon, motivated by the tenuous nature of the circumstances, many more exposures could have been expediently taken. Also surprising is the scarcity of photographs of the mission's chief pioneer, Neil Armstrong, the greatest achievement in human history and of the man whose first step echoed around the world, dawning a new age of scientific enlightenment. There is only one full-body picture of him on the moon, besides this ghostly reflection. This one taken by an automatic camera mounted on the side of the lunar module. Perhaps he feared liability, should the whole conundrum later become unraveled. 
Perhaps he has forgotten that he attested to the authenticity of the event with his signature on this plaque engraved by the federal government. In fact, in the more than 30 years since the event, aside from NASA's initial press conference and the occasional brief anniversary remarks where few questions were permitted, he has never given one on-camera interview to anyone, ever. From an analytical standpoint, photographic anomalies have to be sought out with an understanding of lighting and shadows. The most straightforward is simple. When objects are lit solely by the sun, as all the scenes on the moon were said to be, after all, lighting equipment was not only impractical, it was unnecessary in bright sunlight, then all shadows, regardless of the landscape, will run parallel with one another and never intersect, as shown by this example. In these seldom seen photographs, obtained from a rarely used auxiliary NASA archival site, it is clear that these scenes were lit with artificial light. These shadows, which are cast at different angles, are evidence that a second light source is being used. In addition, the sun would not cause an isolated hot spot like this, only an artificial light would. Again, intersecting shadows and another hot spot. And again. And again. It is simply impossible for this picture to have been taken with sunlight on the moon. Here, the shadows are shown to be as black as pitch. And yet here, completely in a shadow, the astronaut is lit up like a Christmas tree. How can this be? Or this, on the shadow side of the lunar module. In this magnification of an Apollo photograph, a rock, very likely a papier-mâché prop because of the crease here, is categorized with the letter C. In later releases of the same picture, the letter is gone, probably airbrushed out. Here, a crosshair, which was burned directly into the image from the film plate, and thus should always appear on top of the objects in the photograph, appears behind the object in this scene, clearly revealing a composite of two pictures into one. Someone apparently forgot to create a burn crater underneath the lunar module's 10,000-pound thrust engine, despite the fact that during ground tests there was a real concern for the vehicle falling into the hole the engine created as it descended. Here is a Norman Rockwell depiction drawn just two years earlier based on the latest specifications and scientific data. In these enlargements, it looks as though the lunar module was simply placed there, not even one speck of moon dust on the landing pod. As a result, all subsequent flights had to have the same discrepancy, which was explained away by the effect of no atmosphere. And what about stars? On the moon, with no atmosphere, they must have been quite a sight to behold. Yet there is seldom any mention of them, if ever, by any of the astronauts on any of the missions. Undoubtedly, creating a mural with all the constellations properly placed in the sky would have been virtually impossible to create accurately, much less realistically. A competent amateur astronomer would have been able to call attention to the slightest error in measurement. The answer? Not to talk about the stars. Ever. In their post-flight press conference, it was the only question to which Neil Armstrong responded with an absence of memory. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the solar corona what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Years later, though, Michael Collins would remember seeing the elusive stars and wrote about them in Expeditions to the Moon. It seems his memory improved the older he got. Why don't stars appear in any of the photographs? Simply because the proper, mostly closed exposure setting for the camera's iris set that way to compensate for the bright sunlight on the moon's surface completely diminished the faintness of relatively distant specks of diminutive light. This answer is true. It does not, however, explain why they never took any pictures of the stars.